Good morning. So um, I've been meaning to do this video for a while. It's slightly off topic and um, I'm in a beautiful spot here today on the River Thames. So I thought um, I'm on a little boating trip on the river. So I thought while I was here in this lovely spot, I should record this video. And um, good news, it's a bit windy, but good news, I've, uh, I've got my um, wind jammer with me. So hopefully we'll be okay. And what I was going to tell you all about is this huge project I've been working on um, for over 20 years, that long, and I've just completed it. And I want to tell as many people in the world as possible about it so that they uh, all listen. It's an audio project. Now, as you probably know, those that know me will know, um, I have a, an odd professional life in that I double as a financial writer on the one hand but also as a comedian and it's an odd life but it, it seems to work and if you watch this channel you haven't heard any of my songs you're bound to have stumbled across them at some point uh, apparently I'm Nigel Farage's favorite comedian now I've made just made what many would consider a comical investment putting more money time and effort that I care to think about into a theatrical venture on which I'm almost certainly going to lose my shirt. It's got a cast of over 50 people, a 15-piece orchestra. It was recorded at Abbey Road, no less. But I don't care if I lose the money because it's more important than that. So it's to do with my dad, who wrote the original script. Now, he, his name was Terence Frisbee. He had a pretty full and... Um, successful life. His most famous play was called There's a Girl in My Suit, which was the longest running comedy in the history of the world you know, of the West End in the 60s, a worldwide hit. It runs on Broadway in Europe, in Paris, with Gerard Depardieu in Rome, with Domenico Modugno. Um, it was made into a film with Peter Sellers and Goldie Horn, and uh, Dan, Dad run the uh, Writers Guild Award for the best screenplay. Another of his uh, Things, a sitcom, Lucky Fella, starring David Jason, uh, as one of two working class brothers living in a council flat in South East London. Does it sound familiar? <laughs> Became the model for Only Fools and Horses. It was one of ITV's most successful series of the 70s. Another of his series, That's Love, would become one of ITV's most successful sitcoms of the 80s. Dad lost fortunes, he made fortunes, he won awards, he had a string of high profile court cases and beautiful girlfriends, a glamorous wife, my mum, for a bit, and uh, plenty of fresh air. But there was one thing that nagged away at him constantly, like squirrels in the attic of his mind, and that was that he never saw the best thing he ever wrote on the West End stage or on screen. And that thing is Kisses on a Postcard. Now, Kisses began in 1988 as a radio play called Just Remember Two Things. It's not fair and don't be late. That was Dad's motto. And it was a series of reminiscences about his experiences as an evacuee during World War II. And BBC Radio broadcast the play 10 times. It created some sort of record. It received the biggest audience response that anyone in the BBC Radio Drama Department could remember. It even had letters in from people in Germany who'd been evacuated to escape English bombing. Um, it won the Giles Cooper Award for the best radio play, and it was sort of mentioned critically in the same breath as Under Milk Wood and Cider with Rosie. And it then got option to be a film, where it got stuck in development hell for 15 years and the film was never made. Now, Dad's close friend uh, is this chap called Jeremy James Taylor. They worked at the Young Vic together in the 70s, and Jeremy founded the National Youth Music Theatre. Jeremy had been nagging at Dad to turn it into a stage musical. And a chance encounter on a golf course in 2002 in North Devon was the catalyst. And having had the theatre thrust upon me since an early age, I'm not as crazy about it as some. My view is that theatre mostly disappeared up its own backside in around, I don't know, 1974, never to return. Certainly the subsidised stuff anyway. But I've had the theatre shoved down my throat since an early age. Mum loved it, Dad worked in it. Dad adored the theatre, but against all expectation, this tiny community theatre project at the Queen's Theatre Barnstable in North Devon, with mostly amateur performers, 
and a little-known Welsh actor by the name of Derek Crewe in the main role was the best thing I ever saw in the theatre. I remember seeing the producers in the same week, and I liked the producers, but this was better. And suddenly on seeing this, I understood why Dad, Dad loved the theatre so much and what a brilliant medium it can be. And it became, I fell in love with it, and it became one of my lifetime missions to get kisses on a postcard on. It's one of the reasons I actually became a financial writer. I was trying to figure out how to make enough money to put it on. We needed three to five million quid. We tried for many years to raise that money, three to five million quid, to, to bring it into the West End. But then we ran into the global financial crisis in 2008. I remember giving a presentation one evening uh, in Mayfair at a billionaire's club. It was a club where billionaires met. There were more than 20 billionaires in the room. And it was the 6th of October... 2008, which was the day the Icelandic banks went down. So it's pretty hard to secure their interest. Anyway, Dad died in April 2020, probably not a bad time to um, to go to shuffle off the mor this mortal coil, given what was going on at the time, we were just going into lockdown. And as I was going through his things, I came across the script of Kisses on a Postcard. And I took it home and the CD and I stuck it on my shelf and I thought, I'll deal with that later. Then every day, as I was looking up from my desk, this thing kept catching my eye and looking at me longingly like a dog wanting a walk. And after several months, I was like, I can't let this die. It's just too good to be a script gathering dust on a shelf. And if I don't do something about it, no one will. Now, to turn Kisses into a film or a West End show would require millions. And more crucially, powerful allies. You need allies in screen and on TV and I don't have them. But having spent a large chunk of my life in a sound studio, I do a lot of voiceovers as well as the financial writing and the comedy. I did have the means to make some kind of audio project out of it, an audio drama podcast thing. Like a 1970s concept album, War of the Worlds or something like that, but reformatted for the internet. Needed a lot of rewriting do that. The music still wasn't right. Gordon Clyde, who was the original composer, had died in 2008. Dad had turned to various others to fill the gaps, each of whom did their bit beautifully, but the overall result was just a sort of bit disjointed. It needed a unify. So I turned to one of my occasional collaborators, a chap called Martin Wheatley, who is uh, a genius who has somehow managed to remain undiscovered his whole life. <laughs> there are quite a few of them out there. And by coincidence, or as I call it, fate, Martin's father had also been evacuated to Cornwall in World War II at the same time. So we set to work during the lockdown. We composed about ten new songs, as well as unearthing and reversioning a load of Cornish folk songs that only Martin and about three other people have ever heard of. And we've kind of been dogged with... We've been dogged with good luck ever since... John Owen Jones, who was voted the best ever Valjean in Les Mis and the longest running Phantom in Phantom of the... you can guess what. He played the lead role of Uncle Jack, the man who would become stand-in father to my dad and his brother, my uncle. This character was Uncle Jack. He was a former Welsh coal miner, now a plate layer on the Great Western Railway in Cornwall. Fierce, humorous, passionately anti-war and anti-establishment. And when I first spoke to John, and I'm still not sure who was auditioning who, John said, Les Mis, Jesus Christ Superstar, they all started as concept albums. And if you're doing it any other way, West End or theatre, I'd go, no, do it as a concept album first. It's how great things start, great musicals. So then we got the most brilliant cast, we got the most brilliant kids. Everyone was available because of COVID. We had Marsha Warren, who's double award winning, double Olivier award winning, she's the queen mother in the crown. Um, Rosie Cavaliero, who you might know from Wurzel Gummidge, I was at university with her. Katie Seacombe, Harry's daughter from Les Mis. Evelyn Hoskins, Ian Virgo, Simon Thomas. And we were all set to record at an orchestra in a London studio. And then they started to totally break my balls over COVID regulations. Two metres apart, masks, how can the orchestra... Uh, wear masks, all this stuff, and it was just so much hassle. 
So at the last minute, I phoned around all the other studios, and Abbey Road had just had a cancellation because of COVID, and we were able to record it at Abbey Road Studios, so that was another stroke of good fortune. And the result is this concept album, musical, audio only, about an extraordinary time in British history. It tells the story, Kisses on a Postcard, tells the story of Dad and his brother, two boys, aged seven and 11, evacuated from their family in London, down to Cornwall in the war. And those two boys, the other tells the story of those two boys, the other kids who were evacuated in the tiny Cornish village during the war, with its conflicts, kindness, pettiness, generosity and gossip, all turned on its head, first by the arrival of so many children, then by the arrival of American soldiers prior to D-Day. And here's the thing, quite a funny thing. It was a whole regiment came to the village of black GIs. No one in the village had ever seen a black man. But you get the whole story of the war. It, they were all from Louisiana. I don't know why. And we we thought Dad was making it up. We went back and we checked and we found, no, this regiment was billeted on this village. Um, so you get the whole story of the war, from the evacuation of Dunkirk to the evacuation of the kids, through to D-Day and the invasion of Italy. Now, those who were evacuated in, their, in 1940, they'll be in their late 80s now, in their 90s, um, if they're still with us at all. And in many ways, Kisses is a farewell to that generation. So if you know anyone who was evacuated, please play it to them. I'm going to put links, and they'll, they will thank you, I promise it. But I remember being in the car earlier in this year, and I played it to some friends, the first part, um, to them. And during the evacuation scenes, where the kids are all saying goodbye to their parents, they were all like, that's exactly what's happening now in Ukraine. So the story remains so pertinent. As I said, Dad used to get letters from people in Germany who were evacuated to escape Allied bombs. So if you're anything like me, this story will disarm you in the most unexpected ways. And I hope you'll find yourself laughing, weeping, at, as I did, at just what wonderful things the kindest of human beings can be. So what can I say? Please listen to it, share it. It's available via kissesonapostcard.com. You can either order a CD and list, or just listen to it as a podcast. It's also available on Bandcamp. I'll put all the links in the comments comments and there's a, it lasts four hours so it's a bit like an audio but you have to listen to it in intervals over a time there's a shorter two-hour version but in my view it's worth taking the trouble to listen to the full hour version which as i say you can get at kisses on a postcard dot uh, com or kisses on a postcard dot bandcamp dot com and uh, i keep repeating myself now but if you know anyone who's evacuated please get them to listen to it they will thank you so thanks very much for listening and kissesonapostcard.com is where you need to go.